Bug bears and bed bugs. The previous story about bogies in golf has an instructive little postscript. Within a few years, golfers have forgotten the origin of the word bogey, and the par score for a course was blamed on a fictional golfer named Colonel Bogey. A book of golfing cartoons from 1897 contains the line, I, Colonel Bogey, whose score is so uniform and who generally win. This meant that in 1914, when Kenneth Alford wanted a name for his brand new marching tune, he called it Colonel Bogey, and thus Bogey returned to the world of song whence it had sprung. So, <clears throat> who or what was the bogeyman? Bogeymen come in all shapes and sizes. Some are shaped just like bears. They live in the woods. They eat small boys who don't do as they're told. And these are bogey bears. However, the bogey bear has diminished over the years. He's faded from his berry grandeur, both in threat and in the length of the term. Nowadays, a bogey bear is a mere bugbear. And far from de devouring a child whole, he's an insignificant annoyance. Likewise, a bugaboo is now scoffed at by everyone except James Bond. James Bond is very careful about bugaboos, usually checks for them under his bed. Well, etymologically he does. In the 18th century, a bugaboo, which is of course a variant bogeyman, became thieves slang for a sheriff's officer or a policeman. 19th century burglars were therefore scared of bugaboos, or bugs for short. But they kept burgling anyway, and burglaries continued all the way into the 20th century. Indeed, they were so common that people started to set up burglar alarms. And in the 1920s, burglars began to call burglar alarms bugs, on the basis that they acted like an automated policeman. If a solicitous homeowner had fitted an alarm within his house, the joint was said to be bugged. From there, it was one small step for the word bug before it was applied to tiny listening devices that could be placed inside telephones or teapots. And that's why James Bond checks his room for bugs. And that's also why there could actually be an etymological bogeyman hidden beneath your bed. Bogies and bugs have always been pretty much interchangeable. Miles Coverdale's 1535 translation of the Psalms renders the fifth term, fifth verse of the 91st Psalm thus. Thou shalt not need to be afraid of any bugs by night. Most subsequent Bibles have used the word terrors. Coverdale's is therefore known as the Bugs Bible. Then, in the mid 17th century, bug mysteriously started to mean insect. Perhaps this was because insects are terrifying, or perhaps because they used to get into your bed like a bogeyman. The first six-legged bug on record was a bed bug in 1622. Since then, though, the word has expanded to mean any sort of creepy crawly, including insects that crawl inside machines and mess up the workings. There's a story that one of Thomas Edison's inventions kept going wrong. Edison couldn't work out why his machine kept breaking down, but break down it did. He checked all the parts and they worked. He checked the design and it was flawless. Then he went back to check the machine one last time and discovered the cause of the problem. A small insect was crawling around over his delicate electronics and messing everything up. This, so the story goes, is the origin of bug in the sense of technical failing. This story may not be completely true, but it's certainly the case that Thomas Edison was the first personal person to use bug in the technological sense. In 1878, he wrote in a letter that it has been just so in all my inventions, the first step is an intuition and comes with a burst then difficulties arise, this thing gives out, and it is then that bugs 
as such little faults and difficulties are called, show themselves, and months of intense watching, study and labour are requisite before commercial success or failure is certainly reached. And in 1889, the Pall Mall Gazette reported that Mr Edison, I was informed, had been up the two previous nights discovering a bug in his phonograph, an expression for solving a difficulty and implying that some imaginary insect had secreted itself inside and is causing all the trouble. So the insect story could be true, or it could simply be that Edison was referring to bogeyman sprites that haunted his machines, working mischief in the mechanism. Whatever the origin, the word bug caught on, and when your computer crashes due to a software bug, the fault lies with Thomas Edison and the bogeyman. Von Munchausen's computer. New things need new words but they usually end up with old ones. Computers have been around since at least 1613, when being a computer was a skilled profession practised by mathematicians who worked in observatories, adding up numbers. When Charles Babbage invented the precursor of the modern computer, he called it an analytical engine. And when his son improved on design, he called it a mill on the basis that mills were complicated technical things and that, like his new machine, they took stuff in at one end and spat different stuff out at the other. Then, in 1869, machines that could compute the sum of two numbers began to be called computers. And slowly, as those machines started to do more and more things, the word spread. When the first modern computer was officially christened, ENIAC, ENIAC, Electronic Numeral Integrator and Computer in 1946. It was already too late. Early computers were simply calculators, hence the name. Then they got software which had to be loaded up by the user. Then in the 50s, a method was invented whereby a computer would install its own software. The idea was that a single piece of code was loaded, which in turn would load up some more pieces of code, which would load more and more until the computer had a... But first, we must explain about Baron von Munchausen in the marsh. Baron von Munchausen, 1720 to 1797, was a real person who had fought as a soldier in Russia. On his return home, he told stories about his exploits that nobody believed. These included riding on a cannonball, taking a brief trip to the moon, and escaping from a marsh by pulling himself out by his own hair. This latter feat is impossible, for the upward force on the Baron's hair would have cancelled, been cancelled out by the downward force on his arm. It's a nice idea though, and von Munchausen's preposterous principle was later taken up by Americans. But instead of talking about hair, the Americans started in the late 19th century to talk of pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. What's impossible in physics is possible in computing, and computer that's able to load its own programs is metaphorically pulling itself up by its own bootstraps. In 1953 the process was called a bootstrap. By 1975 people had got bored with the strap and from then on, computers simply booted up. Spam, not spam. In 1937, a new product came onto the American market. It was made primarily of pork and potato starch and was originally called Hormel Spiced Ham because it was made by George A. Hormel and co. However, a vice president of Hormel had a brother who was an actor, and presumably much better with words, and he suggested that it be shortened from spiced ham to spam. Another story says that spam may stand for shoulder of pork and ham. Either way, the Hormel Foods Corporation insists to this day that it should be spelt with capital letters S-P-A-M, not spam. Hitler 
made Spam a great success. The Second World War caused food shortages in Britain, which caused strict rationing of fresh meat, which caused Britons to turn to tinned meat as it was less tightly rationed. The tinned meat to which the warlike Britons turned was Spam, and this was shipped from America in gargantuan qualities and quantities. After the war, Spam remained a staple of the British diet, especially in cheap cafes, which is where Monty Python comes in. In 1970, Monty Python produced the Spam sketch in which two people are lowered into a nasty cafe somewhere in Britain where almost every dish contains Spam. After a while, a group of Vikings also happens to be in the cafe. Start, they start singing a song to which the only words are Spam, 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 on and on and on, ad infinitum et nauseam. Monty Python is, for reasons best known to nobody, rather popular with computer programmers. There's even a programming language called Python based on their sketches. This leads us inevitably to multi-user dungeons or MUDs. Multi-user dungeons are not, as you might have imagined, strange basement rooms in the red light district. Instead, they were an early form of internet game that existed in the 1980s. Clever computer fellows would use MUDs to show each other programs that they had written. But the most popular of these programs was a very simple practical joke. The first command in the joke program was that the computer would print the word spam. The second command was to go back to the first command. The result was that the lyrics to the Monty Python song would be printed out as a screen full of spam. This would scroll down your screen forever and you couldn't stop it. By 1990, spam had become programmer's slang for anything unwanted on the internet. When the Monty Python joke was continued on Usenet in the early 1990s, the word spam gained wider kind of currency. And that's why when that Nigerian prince, with all the Viagra and the saucy photographs of Britney Spears, started sending his emails, they were called spam. Or more probably, properly, spam. You must remember that spam is a proprietary name, just like heroin. Heroin. Once upon a time, cough medicines all contained morphine. This made people worried. You see, morphine is addictive, which meant that if you had a bad cold and took the cough medicine for too long, you might cure the cough, but wind up physically dependent upon the remedy. The poor coffer of a hundred years ago was therefore faced with the choice, keep hacking away or risk becoming a morphine addict and many chose the cough. So in 1898, a German pharmaceutical company called Bayer decided to develop an alternative. They got out their primitive pipettes and rude retorts and worked out a new chemical, diacetyl morphine, which they marketed as a non-addictive morphine substitute. Like all new products, it needed a brand name. Diacetyl morphine was all right if you're a scientist, but it wasn't going to work at the counter of a drugstore. They needed a name that would sell, a name that would make people say, yes, I want to buy that product. So buyers marketing chaps set to work. They asked the people who had taken diacetyl morphine how it made them feel. And the response was unanimous. It made you feel great, like a hero. So the marketing chaps decided to call their new product heroin. And guess what? It did sell. Heroin remained a buyer trademark until the First World War, but the, the non-addictive part turned out a little misguided. And that's why heroines are connected to heroin. And it was all because people didn't want to be enthralled to morphine. Morphine de Quincey and Shelley. Morpheus, from which morphine derives, was the Greek god of dreams. He was the son of sleep and the brother of fantasy, and he lived in a cave near the underworld where he would make dreams and then hang them up upon a withered elm until they were ready to use. Morpheus 
was the shaper of dreams. His name comes from the Greek morphe, meaning shape. That is why you are amorphous. It doesn't mean that you're fresh out of morphine. Instead, that you are shapeless. Drugs and dreams are an easy association. If you smoke a pipe full of opium, you will, like as not, fall asleep and have a pipe dream. The most famous consumer of opium was a 19th century fellow called Thomas de Quincey, who wrote a memoir called Confessions of an English Opium Eater, which contains a wonderful and strange account of his drugged dreams. I was stared at, hooted at, grinned at, chattered at by monkeys, by parakeets, by cockatoos. I ran into pagodas and was fixed for centuries at the summit or in secret rooms. I was the idol. I was the priest. I was worshipped. I was sacrificed. I fled from the wrath of Brahma through all the forests of Asia. Vishnu hated me. Siva lay in wait for me. I came suddenly upon Isis and Osiris. I had done a deed, they said, which the ibis and the crocodile trembled at. Thousands of years I lived and was buried in stone coffins with mummies and sphinxes in narrow chambers at the heart of eternal pyramids. I was kissed with cancerous kisses by crocodiles and was laid confounded with all unutterable abortions amongst reeds and nilotic mud. De Quincey's opium dreams sound a little less than fun and much of his biography is about his efforts to give up the drug. The book is much more moving than it is honest. In fact, when De Quincey wrote his confessions, he was simply out of cash and couldn't afford a fix. Luckily, the book was so successful that he was able to maintain himself in top-drawn narcotics for the rest of his life. This life was surprisingly long. While near contemporaries like Shelley, Keats and Byron fell out of boats, perished of consumption or died feverishly in Greece, De Quincey, drugged up to the eyeballs and beyond, survived them all by 35 years and died of a fever at the overripe age of 74. He had been taking opium for 55 years. During his long and meandering literary career, De Quincey was a master inventor of words. His opium fumigated brain was a mint where neologisms were coined at a remarkable rate. The Oxford English Dictionary attributes 159 words to him. Many of these, like passiuncle, a small passion, are forgotten, yet many survive. Without De Quincey, we would have no subconscious, no entourages, no incubators, no interconnections. We'd be able neither to intuit nor to reposition things. He was phenomenally inventive, earth-shatteringly so. He even came up with the word postnatal which has allowed people to be depressed ever since. Antenatal had already been invented by the poet Percy Shelley. Shelley wrote an earth-shatteringly tedious poem called Prince Athenaise. The story goes like this. Basically, there's a prince and he's great and stuff, but like every second bloody hero of romantic poetry, he's mysteriously sad. Nobody knows why. Some said he was mad. Others believed that memories of an antenatal life made this, where he now dwelt, a penal hell. Others believed that Shelley had talent, but needed a damn fine editor. Like De Quincey, when Shelley couldn't think of a word, he just made one up. By the time he drowned at the age of 29, he had already come up with the words spectral, anklet, optimistic, in the sense of a hopeful disposition, and heartless, in the sense of cruel. He invented bloodstain, expatriate, expressionless, interestingly, legionnaire, moonlit, sunlit, pedestrianise, although not in our sense, petty-minded, steamship, unattractive, undefeated, unfulfilling, unrecognised, wavelet and white-hot. He even invented the phrase national anthem. Star-Spangled Drinking Songs A spangle is, of course, a little spang. A spang being a small, glittering ornament. Therefore, to be spangled 
is to be covered in small spangs, a fate that befalls the best of us at times. The word spangled crops up in a poem by Thomas More, not the famous one you understand, but the 19th century Irish poetaster. He wrote, As late I sought the spangled bowers to colour wreath of matin flowers. It was one of Moore's translations from the Greek poet Anacreon, who was an ancient boozer and lover and lyric poet. Anacreon's poems, Anacreontics, are all about getting drunk and making lyrical love in Greek groves. Anacreon was therefore a good thing. Anacreon was indeed such a good thing that in the 18th century, an English gentleman's club was founded in his memory. It was called the Anacreontic Society and was devoted to wit, harmony and the god of wine. It was a very musical affair and two members wrote a society drinking song called To Anacreon in Heaven. John Stafford Smith wrote the tune and the society's president, President Ralph Tomlinson, wrote the words. The first verse ran thus. To Anacreon in heaven, where he sat in full glee, a few sons of harmony sent a petition that he their inspirer and patron would be when this answer arrived from the jolly old Grecian. Voice, fiddle and flute, no longer be mute. I'll lend you my name and inspire you to boot. But besides, I'll instruct you to, like me, to entwine the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's wine. Bacchus's wine is, of course, booze, and Venus was a goddess of sex. To Anacreon in heaven was a good song with a very catchy tune, which you know. Because it was hard to sing, it became an ad hoc test of drunkenness used by the police in the 18th century. If you could sing to Anacreon in heaven in tune, you were sober and free to go. This is, if you think about it, an odd fate for a drinking song. It's also rather unfair on those who can't sing. Unfortunately, the song was so popular that it was usurped and stolen by a chap called Francis Scott Key, who wrote new words that weren't about drink, but about being able to see a flag flying after a bombardment. Francis Scott Key was an American lawyer. During the war of 1812, he was sent to negotiate with the British fleet for the release of certain prisoners. He dined aboard HMS Tonnant. But when the time came for him to leave, the British got worried. Key was now familiar with British battleships. If he went ashore, he could and would pass all this information on to the American forces. And this was problematic as the British were planning to bombard Baltimore first thing in the morning. And if the Americans found out, it would spoil the fun. So they insisted that Key remain on board and he was forced to watch the bombardment from the wrong side or the right side, if you're thinking about personal safety. Bang went the guns, but the American flag at Baltimore remained high and visible amid the smoke. Key decided to write a song about it. He stole the tune from the Anacreontic Society, but wrote new words that went, Oh say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed as the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through perilous fight, oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there, Oh say, does the star-spangled banner still wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? And the new title that he gave to an old drinking song takes us straight back to Small Spangs. Torpedoes and Turtles The conflict between the Royal Navy and the revolutionary Americans also gave us the word torpedo, which has nothing and everything to do with being torpid. The Latin word for tired or numb was torpidus. From this we got the adjective torpid, which is still with us today. And that would be the end of the story were it not for electrical fish. That there are electric eels is commonly known, but there are also kinds of ray that can produce electricity. In fact, they can produce 220 volts of the stuff, which is quite enough to knock you out and therefore render you torpid. In English, 
They were once called numb fish or cramp fish. But the educated Latin name is Torpedi iniformes, with the major family being the torpedoes. As Lawrence Andrew put it in his snappily titled book of 1520, the noble life and nature of man, of beasts, serpents, fowls and fishes, he boast mostly known. Torpedo is a fish, but whoso handleth him shall be lame and deaf of limbs, that he shall feel no thing. For a long time, therefore, a torpedo was simply something that rendered you incapable. For example, there was an 18th century dandy called Beau Nash, who was awfully witty but had trouble writing well. He used to call a pen his torpedo, for whenever he grasped it, it numbed all his faculties. This is a shame, as Nash was meant to be the wittiest, most charming man of his day, and when he died, his wife went to live in a hollow tree near Warminster. But to return to the story, in 1776, the Americans were revolting. The British Navy sailed to New York, but so revolting were the Americans that the Brits decided to stay in the channel and blockade the harbour. The Americans didn't like this, and there was a fellow called Bushnell who invented a submarine with which to attack the blockading British boats in the most unsporting manner. Bushnell could didn't decide what to call his new submarine. He seems to have been in two minds between the American turtle and the torpedo. In shape, it resembled both. Eventually, he decided on the latter. The idea of the submarine was that it had a, a magazine or powder attached to it that it would screw to the hull of the British flagship. A timer would then be set, giving the submarine a few minutes to get clear, and then there'd be a big explosion and the British boat would be blown to smithereens and beyond. This didn't happen, as the revolting Americans were foiled by the hulls of the British ships, which were copper-bottomed. But the Americans were not to be deterred. Another invention called, inventor called Fulton took up where Bushnell left off. Bushnell, for some reason, ran away to the south and took on a new identity. Fulton worked to the same general plan, but he gave the name Torpedo to the explosive device rather than the submarine itself. He also decided to change it a bit. Rather than the submarine getting right up to the enemy ship, he would instead fire a harpoon at it. The explosive device would be attached to the harpoon by a rope and contain within it a timer, so the submarine would pop up, harpoon the ship and disappear before the charge went off. Fulton's torpedoes didn't work either. Decades passed of utterly ineffective torpedo inventing and improvement. The torpedo was fitted with a motor and other such gizmos, but nothing was sunk with a vile torpedo until 1878, when a Russian ship torpedoed an Ottoman one. And that's how tired and numb came to be a name for something fast and explosive. Now, before the next story, what's the connection between Mount Vernon in Virginia, Portobello Road in London, and Feeling Groggy? From Mount Vernon to Portobello Road with a hangover. Relations between the Royal Navy and the Americans were, as we have seen, fraught. However, it was not always thus. The fault lies with George Washington. But George had an elder half-brother and mentor called Lawrence Washington, who had in fact been a British soldier. Spe specifically, he was a Marine in the Royal Navy. As a recruit from the British Dominions in North America, he served under Admiral Edward Vernon in the Caribbean and was part of the force that seized a strategically important base called Guantanamo which has some minor position in Northern history. Lawrence Washington was very attached to Admiral Vernon. So loyal was he that when he went home to the family estate, which had been called Little Hunting Creek Plantation, he decided to rename it Mount Vernon. So Washington's house was named after a British animal, Admiral. Admiral Vernon's naming exploits didn't end there though, 
In 1739, Vernon led the British assault on Porto Bello in what is now Panama. He had only six ships, but with lots of daring do and British pluck, etc., etc., he won a startling victory. In fact, so startling was the victory that a patriotic English farmer heard the news, dashed off to the countryside west of London and built Portobello Farm in honour of the victory's startlingness. Green Lane, which was nearby, soon became known as Portobello Lane and then Portobello Road. And that's why the London market, now one of the largest antique markets in the world, is called Portobello Market. But Admiral Vernon's naming exploits didn't end there either. When the seas were stormy, he used to wear a thick coat made out of a coarse material called grogram, from the French gros grain. So his men nicknamed him Old Grog. British sailors used to have a daily allowance of rum. In 1740, flushed from victory at Portobello and perhaps under the pernicious influence of Lawrence Washington, Vernon ordered that the rum be watered down. The resulting mixture, which eventually became standard for the whole Navy, was also named after Vernon. It was called Grog. If you drank too much Grog, you became drunk or groggy. And the meaning has slowly shifted from there to the wages of gin, a hangover. A punch of drinks. The etymology of alcohol is as unsteady as one would have suspected. For starters, the word alcohol is Arabic. This may seem odd, given that Islam is a teetotal religion, but when the Arabs used the word alcohol, they didn't mean the same stuff that we do. Alcohol comes from al, meaning the, kuhul, which is a kind of makeup. Indeed, some ladies still use coal to line their eyes. As coal is an extract and a dye, alcohol started to mean the pure essence of anything. There's a 1661 reference to the alcohol of an ass's spleen. But it wasn't until 1672 that somebody at the Royal Society had the bright idea of finding the pure essence of wine. What was it in wine that made you drunk? What was the alcohol of wine? Soon, wine alcohol, or essence of wine, became the only alcohol anybody could remember. And then in 1753, everybody got so drunk that wine alcohol was shortened to alcohol. Spirits arrived in the drinks cabinet by almost exactly the same route, but this time from alchemy. In alchemy, there's the Arabic the again, al, every chemical was thought to contain vital spirits little fairies who lived in the substance and made it do funny things. On this basis, gunpowder contained fiery spirits, acid contained biting spirits, and things like whiskey and vodka contained the best spirits of all the ones that got you plastered. It's odd that whiskey and vodka get you drunk at all, as according to their names, they're both water. Vodka came from the Russian voda, which means water, and indeed both words come from the same Proto-Indo-European root, wador. The word whiskey is surprisingly recent. It's not recorded before 1715 when it leapt into the lexicon with the sterling sentence, whiskey shall put our brains in a rage. Philologists, philologists though, are reasonably agreed that it comes from the Gaelic wisa betha, meaning water of life. Why the water of life? The Scots hadn't made the name up. They merely took it from alchemical Latin. Alchemists, who were trying to turn base metal into gold, could find consolation for their failure in the fact that it's pretty damned easy to distill alcohol, which they called ardent spirits or aqua vitae, water of life. It wasn't only drunken Scotsmen who took aqua vitae into their own language. The Scandinavians called their home brew aquavit without even bothering to translate, and the French called their brandy eau de vie. However, water of life is also a delightful euphemism for urine. 
which should be drunk in moderation. Moraji Desai, who was Prime Minister of India, used to start every day by drinking the liquor brewed in his own internal distillery, which he always referred to as the water of life. Desai claimed that Gandhi had taught him the trick, although the Gandhi Institute denies this vehemently, says that Desai's story is balderdash. Oh, balderdash. Balderdash used to be a kind of drink as well. Not a very good kind of drink, mind you. It was wine mixed with beer or water or anything else that meant you could sell it cheap. Balderdash was strange stuff, but not nearly so rum as rum. Rum was once a thieves word meaning good. But like most thieves slang, the adjective rum got a bad reputation and started to mean queer or a little bit fishy. It's hard to say which of these uses caused the Caribbean spirit, previously known as Kill Devil, to be named Rumbullion. Or perhaps it was just a variant of rum booze in reference to rum's strong and sugary nature. It might even be something to do with the Devon dialect word Rumbullion, meaning uproar. Or it could be the Nora Yor Reto. Or it, maybe it was a rum bouillon or strange brew. Either way, rum is first recorded in 1654, and by 1683, people were already making rum punch. Vodka, whiskey, aquavit, balderdash and rum are just enough to make the sort of punch that will knock you out. Only just, mind you, because punch comes from the Hindu word for five, punch. That's because, technically, a punch should contain five different ingredients. Spirits, water, lemon juice, sugar and spice. That's also the reason that the area of India that contains five ridvas is called the Punjab. Punch derives from the Sanskrit for five, pankas, which comes from the Proto-Indo-European penkwe, which went into Greek as pent and gave us pentagon. But if you want to get properly sloshed, you need the queen of drinks, champagne.